so three very different uh, themes, three very different presentations. So now uh, we have time for questions. So um, let's open the floor. Uh, I had a question on the, uh, actually the last slide of Sankar, but that relates to first slide of Mike, the national water data gaps. I don't know if that slide can be uh, turned on. Yes. Um, it's actually a question to both of you and maybe to the whole floor. I, I, don't, I don't have enough knowledge on the geologic layer underneath, but is it, the, is it, it looks like we are monitoring only where we are extensively drawing groundwater from. We are not really monitoring the other areas. Is there a particular reason for this? Uh, if you dig through this, if you dig through the data portal, which I was just doing this morning, uh, these are by, um, a lot of these are by aquifer. So you'll see there's a density of stations on a specific aquifer that was given um, money to invest in wells in some cases, or the state was interested. You can see New Jersey very clearly, um, you know, they, they had some investment or they had some method of getting that data together. Each of these networks has to pay for themselves in some way. Uh, so they have some purpose. Uh, I, I like to talk about purpose of network. Not every, you, you have your data that you need collected in this way, but that's not what you get. You have to take what you get. You have to, you have to take what you're given in some cases and be able to adapt or adjust your metrics uh, to accommodate what's available. So. All right, anyone else? Question for Helen. Uh, I've heard that there is some type of in situ microbial sensors that are being developed now. Can you say something about that? It depends on what you want to find out. Because if you want a, uh, like salt tracking, for example, you know, then you will need something like a gen um, genome sequencing. Sequence, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that takes time. But that's actually a very powerful tool because, for example, you know, now CDC can track food uh, born outbreak, what farm it comes from, or like, you know, our colleague in public health know where Ebola comes from. So it it's could be done for, for groundwater too. If you just want to know whether or not you have like a specific type of bacteria or pathogen like Salmonella, or E. coli or something like that. You know, they, they now people in sensor development, they can develop paper-based type of sensor or with your cell phone. You know, now you no longer need to have like a microscope or PCR offside. You can actually do, do it on film. It's not green time yet. And uh, so I have a, I am working with a colleague who tried to make that device to about like $10 a piece together with your smartphone. So just a couple questions. Is one, I guess fracking is now starting to become a very big thing. So how would that have the overall implications on water quality? And so will aquifer storage and recovery when you're taking those flooded areas and pumping it back into the groundwater so you kind of don't know what's in that. How is that actually done and what's the implications? I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab. I, I, just an overview of it. Fracking in some ways just is a, it's a, it becomes a highway in the soil. So it's a, it's a fracture that, that shortens your residency times. A lot of times we use ground, the ground as a filter. And so you're, you're bypassing that filter with fracking. So um, just you, you get into the, the realm of chaos theory and chaos uh, mapping and, uh, because fractals and fractures, they have the same base for a reason. They're unpredictable yet oddly predictable. Most of the fracking actually is occurring at very, very deep depths where it's not going to affect groundwater aquifers directly. Uh, when you dispose of water that is brought up after fracking operations, even that, that's occurring even deeper than the actual fracking in many cases. It causes induced seismicity in places like Oklahoma that we are hearing about a lot. 
the greater challenge of contamination occurs from handling those waters near the surface in holding ponds and things like that. Uh, and that is, you know, that, that's a certainly a risk to groundwater resources, but the other risks are less than uh, most people would imagine. Just to add, add to that, um, um, at least some of the incidents of contamination in, in Pennsylvania are related to poorly uh, installed wells and well bores rather than actually coming from the fracking. So we don't, we don't ultimately know if we're increasing the permeability of confining units. Uh, that, that's still an open question, but it's, it, I would agree with Hari that it's, it's, uh, these are pretty deep operations and um, it's, it's more likely that it's due to improper uh, well development uh, and, and leakage along, along well bores than uh, directly coming uh, up from shales. Ali? Um, I had a quick question to Helen. Helen, uh, I was very intrigued by that um, figure on rotavirus movement through groundwater. Is that uh, based on U.S. groundwater data? And also, if you have done any studies in the developing world on this, are, w do you expect similar uh, similar behavior? So, rotavirus infection is basically everywhere, but it hit other countries a lot harder compared to the U.S. Um, so it, uh, so the study we look at it at micro screen. So we try to explain why rotavirus is very mobile in subsurface environment. Um, rotavirus on the problem with rotavirus is that it infect many animals. So you have pigs infected with rotavirus. We have cows. You have sheep and whatever infected with rotavirus. And rotav uh, rotavirus the uh, Trying to, okay, not to get into too much genome stuff. Um, so it's, it's very easy to change, to mutate. So you can imagine that if uh, either you or an animal get infected by two different types of the virus, a human virus and an animal virus, and what virus coming out could have a hybrid characteristic of both human and, and an animal. And we found that a big rotavirus is a lot more persistent in the environment compared to a human rotavirus. So that's another issue that is very important because uh, of the zoonotic um, you know, route of infections. Anyone else? So I, I really like the, the last presentation. You mentioned about the total water uh, withdrawal, but you also mentioned the water use efficiency and water consumption. So I think it's very important, like even though with the same amount of water withdrawal and with a different irrigation method, like the flood irrigation or drip irrigation, the water consumption is different. So the, it will change the impacts on the whole water cycle. Like it will change the impacts on, on, on infiltration or ET. So like it's really the direction we are moving for the uh, traditional water resources management because the traditional water resources management is really like um, focus on water withdrawal rather than water consumption. So right now we are the the example you are mentioned in in China in that in that area we actually have a project over there, so we are focusing on how the water consumption like the changes of the irrigation method really will impact the whole water supply over there. So yeah, glad to talk to you more. I mean, I think we are just getting started on that one and. Uh, the, the issue is, to, again, you know, need to look at the, the, uh, they, they, the water use data in China is, is very rich. I mean, every year they do collect each province and it's reported even at the district level. And the question is obviously, you know, like for example, the 2011 report I mentioned here, uh, it, it gives some sort of guidance in terms of where to look for and what is the quality 
we are getting. And the same thing applies in the case of China too. And uh, so, I mean, luckily I have a faculty from China Institute of Hydropower and Water Resources. So naturally she has access to most of this data, not in digital form, but in a, in a, in a as a printed document. So, so it's a challenge, but on the other hand, you know, in two big countries, you know, you are looking at the water use here in over a longer time scale, so. Um, all right, so I think uh, we're going to close this uh, session, and uh, next step is uh, coffee.